All right. Um, I was going to start this off and say, for those of you that don't know me, but if you don't know me by now, there's something wrong. Um, I've been here long enough. So. Uh, today's topic is uh, weaning from ECMO. But let's, let's take a step back before we talk about the mechanics of ECMO. And I'm going to mostly concentrate on BV ECMO, because it's mostly what the intensivists do. Um, of course, we also manage VA ECMO, but that's co-managed with our cardiothoracic surgeon. So I want to emphasize that ECMO is not, in and of itself, a life-saving modality. There's not, it's not a treatment uh, for people, per se. What ECMO is, is it buys you time. So ultimately, as we all know, your body heals itself in some way, shape, or form. And we have to give it the opportunity to give it, uh, to heal itself. If you fall behind um, because you have an overwhelming infection um, uh, and you develop um, this massive ARDS, um, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, and you simply cannot oxygenate anymore, well, that, that disease would normally overcome your ability to, you know, for yourself to heal. What ECMO allows us to do is say, okay, the disease has progressed so far, and it really is outside your scope right now. Normally, you would pass. But now we can put you on ECMO and buy you a little time. Now, we have to remember that what we're doing in that time period is, is we're trying to treat the underlying disease. And that's an important factor for when we start to have patient selection. We need to look at patients and say to ourselves, is there something reversible in this individual that we can put someone on ECMO for one to five days or so? And within that intervening period, can we get antibiotics on board at the proper concentration or the proper antibiotic? Can we turn them around? Can we um, maybe get a better fluid uh, status, a status in them? Do they need uh, higher dosages of steroids to reduce inflammation uh, in their body? Or et cetera, et cetera. That should be something that we can correct. So in general, when we're looking at um, individuals who are going to go on ECMO, it's really survivability. And there are some uh, general rules of thumb that we look for in terms of patient selection um, before we put someone on ECMO. And I'll try to just get to the most important ones. There is a, a relative cutoff for ECMO of someone who's age 60 or less. That is relative. I mean, you could have a very healthy 62-year-old or 63-year-old and you take that into consideration, but um, that's an artificial marker that people have used. Um, you have to have a reversible condition, which is what we were just talking about, something that you feel as if you could, uh, you could change. Um, we don't like to put terminally ill cancer patients on ECMO. If they, we know that they're going to pass, you know, we would, uh, uh, we would not put that patient on ECMO. Or if they had any other terminal diseases coming in. So, for example, if this was an end-stage COPD patient or otherwise, something that we can't change. If you smoked for 90 years of your life, I can't change that. If you happen to be a 41-year-old who got flu and now you're an ARDS, well, that's, we can change that, hopefully. Um, so now let's talk about uh, ECMO. So there are two general types uh, of ECMO, we call venous venous, which is VV, and VA, which is venous arterial. So let's talk about um, the differences between those two. So uh, venous, venous ECMO. So what this is used for is it's used for respiratory failure. And it's easier just to say ARDS. So what is VO, uh, VV ECMO and how does it look? Well, there's a few different ways to do it. In general, what you're doing is you're taking um, blood out of the venous tree and giving it back. And I'm going to talk about probably the most simplest way to do that is with the Avalon catheter. So here we would look and we'd have the heart. And here we have the superior vena cava. Down here, we have the inferior vena cava. You have the right side of the heart here and the left side. So here's your tricuspid valve, also put TV, <clears throat> and on the left side of the heart you have your mitral valve on this side. So what we can do is, is in VV ECMO, we can use an Avalon catheter. What it is is a double looming catheter. The catheter comes in here, and it's going to pass straight through the heart, through the atrium, down into the IVC. Within the IVC, there's going to be a port here, and that's going to suck blood um, into, uh, into the ECMO circuit. And within the SVC up here, there's going to be a hole that sucks blood into the ECMO circuit. So now this blood is going to come out, and we'll get to it. We'll just say ECMO for now, and I'll draw this later on. This is going to go into the ECMO circuit. 
when it goes through the ECMO circuit, and I'll go over the pump and the oxygenator and the sweep, then eventually it'll come back to the patient, uh, oxygenated and the CO2 removed, and this blood comes back, and through a second lumen, it comes out right here within the tricuspid valve, and it goes straight into the right ventricle. So, uh, I think we've only put one here. I think I will put one and put it in. We might put a second one in. When we do this procedure putting in the uh, Avalon catheter, which is what this is called, the VV double lumen, what we do is we do this under fluoroscopy because what we need to do is make sure that this outflow uh, opening goes straight into the herpes valve into the right ventricle. That's very important. So all these holes have to line up. So our going into the ECMO machine and then coming out here and then going into the right ventricle. That's how this particular uh, thing works. So. Now, what about the ECMO circuit itself? Is there anything? This is like very simple. So let's just elaborate on what the ECMO circuit is. So what the ECMO circuit is, is you have a pump. This is pretty straightforward, right? The blood comes in, and there needs to be like a rotary mechanism for it to come out. Um, you have two general types of uh, pumps. You have like a rotary pump, which is like the good old-fashioned kind of thing that just kind of turns around. That could break down a lot of red blood cells. So these days, we use like a magnetic pump, which kind of turns it, which is more gentle on the blood. Um, after you go through the pump, then you're going to go through an oxygenator. And then what you also have is you have uh, a sweet gas. So let's go with this. So I want you to picture this uh, like this, right? You have blood coming out of the ECMO circuit, and this is the top part right here. And then you have another stream going this way. You can think of it like this. So blood going this way. This is your blood. And down here, we'll say that you have oxygen. And it's just really just oxygen, okay, coming this way. So as blood goes past this way, you can change your oxygen concentration so the blood becomes saturated. What you also do is you can change how fast this flow is going this way. And when you change how fast the flow is going this way, what happens is, is just how oxygen is going from this oxygen source up here. CO2 is going down here. So the faster you run this, the lower the CO2 concentration is down here, you pull more CO2 out. Those are the only two things you're doing. You can change the fraction of oxygen, 100%, you know, whatever you want, 90%, 8%, and that gets the uh, oxygen up there. Or you can change how fast the sweep is going, that flow, which pulls the CO2 out of the bloodstream a little faster. So now this will come back into the patient and come into here, and now you have your oxygenated um, and your CO2 removed uh, blood. Um, that's, uh, that's important because when we put people on you know, ECMO, they either are hypoxic respiratory failure, oxygen problem, hypercarbic respiratory failure, or they could be both. And so both of these things that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll manipulate. Um, so that, that's pretty much how it works. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. So now, we have our ARDS patient, we put our Avalon catheter in, just as a review, two outport uh, 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 ports going into the ECMO circuit, one coming in here, we have to line this one right to the tricuspid valve, goes into the right ventricle to the patient. Here you're going to have just your pump, and then your oxygenator, and then your sweep, you get the CO2 out. And now it becomes, what do I do in terms of managing the patient on the bed? So um, we... Uh, have our ARDS patient, and one of the first things we want to do is we want to rest the lungs. We don't want them to breathe um, that much anymore. We want to reduce their metabolic volumes and pretty much just give their lungs an opportunity to have a break. So how do we want to do that? Well, it's important to note that the primary driver for you to breathe is CO2. So most people um, have a PaCO2, a partial pressure of CO2 in their blood, of 40. And we are extremely responsive to that partial pressure of CO2. If we raise that number up to 41, most of us would increase our minute ventilation by one to two liters. Remember that minute ventilation is just the number of times you breathe in a minute times how big your tidal volumes are. You put those two things as your minute ventilation. So you would either breathe faster or you'd breathe deeper and you'd be very responsive to it. So in terms of resting the patient's lungs, um, probably what we're used to um, when we're taking care of these ICU patients is we're used to resting the lungs and getting control of the ventilation by just sedating the bejeevers. 
uh, out of our patients. That's what we do. We increase our fentanyl. We get like you know who knows you know four or five other sedative medications on. But here, when we're on ECMO, we have the ability to increase our sweep gas flow and lower our CO2, rendering the patient not wanting to breathe. And that's really the best way to do it so we can have less sedation on board. Um, which now, from here, I'll take a step back. There are really two ways now to manage this patient who is on ECMO. Technically, we're driving a huge portion of their oxygenation and CO2 removal. You know, sometimes really like 90%. Um, we have the choice to sedate them um, and have them be comfortable, uh, which is probably safer so they don't pull things out because these are really tenuous kind of catheters at it. Or some places like UCSF, they actually have people wake up um, and they're on the vent, they're awake. I think for some patients, we'll choose to do that. It's more of a nursing requirement then because we really have to watch the patients very carefully and you know, it's a risk. Um, but here I'm going to pretty much concentrate on the patients that we're going to sedate. But just know that we might choose to wake them up. So even though we're sedating them, we can dramatically reduce our sedation requirements by increasing that sweep, getting their PaCO2 down. Now there are some particulars about having a PaCO2. Um, what we have learned is, is that when most people think about blowing off CO2 and lowering CO2 from the body, they think about patients who come in with head, bleed, uh, head injuries, where they increase their intracranial pressure. And we've known for quite some time that we can hyperventilate a patient, lower their PaCO2, and it constricts blood vessels to the brain. And by constricting the blood vessels to the brain, you lower the amount of blood there, and it decreases the pressure in your head. And that could be life-saving for some people who might be at risk for herniation, etc. But what we've learned from that is, is that if you lower the PaCO2 too low, um, then you can actually precipitate a stroke. So in general, what we feel is, is that if you have a PaCO2 between 25 and 30 that's too low, you'll probably give them a stroke. Uh, if you had them long periods of time, or you're at risk, I should say, not probably, you're at risk of. Um, keeping patients comfortably, say, 32 to 35 appears to be safe, and there's no issues with that. So um, I generally lower someone down as much as they need to get someone controlled on the vent, um, but I don't try to go lower than 32 because of risk of, uh, of, risk of hurting them um, with the uh, with possibility for stroke. So why, do I, why am I emphasizing this? Because this is management in day one. So in general, for day one, what we're looking at is resting the lungs. And so here we are resting. Um, and we primarily do that by taking control. Now the other thing we want to do is when we're resting the lungs, we just don't want them just to collapse. Because lungs are supposed to be open. And so usually what we do is we dial in settings that just kind of keep the lungs open a little bit. So the settings that we'll normally do are something along the lines of like maybe a respiratory rate of 10, maybe a tidal volume of 200, which is so small. And this is probably the biggest one, a peep that's higher. A peep that's at least 10 or something like that. This way it stents open the lungs. So with day one, resting the lungs, trying to get ahead. So now comes like the challenge. What do you do for days two, three, and four in terms of weaning someone from, uh, from ECMO. The most important thing of weaning someone from ECMO is, is that before you went into this, you recognized that you had a re you thought that you had a reversible condition and you've instituted treatment for whatever that is. The person's fluid overloaded, you have CDVH on board and you're taking fluid off. The person is massively septic, you have the right antibiotics on board. The patient has some inflammatory other condition of the lungs, you have the proper steroids on board, but you have to treat. So then from here, what we can do is we can slowly, there's two, rule, there's two schools of thought here. One school of thought rests someone's lung, um, and then they quickly take someone off uh, ECMO if they can. Another school of thought slowly wean someone off of ECMO, kind of like they give a little bit more to the lungs, um, uh, and as they're doing a little bit more to the lungs, then what they do is they slowly titrate back what the uh, ECMO machine uh, is doing. So how do we do that? Well, it's important that to note that when we have our perfusionists here who are running the ECMO circuit, they'll be doing blood gases here. And eventually we'll be doing blood gases, either the ICU team of physicians or our nursing staff when we get trained in ECMO, etc. When we get blood um, here, uh, blood gases here from the ECMO circuit, you're getting blood that's going to have a low CO2 and you're getting blood that's going to have a very high oxygen, oxygen content because it's coming straight out of here. Now, that is going to come straight into the ventricle here. And you can see numbers like a PaO2 of like 500, so very high partial pressure, and then whatever your CO2 is, doesn't matter. 
Um, it's important not to be fooled by that high concentration of oxygen when we're going to start the wean solenol off because, of course, that number is going to be high because you just went through the ECMO circuit. But what you're missing is, is that not 100% of blood is being sucked out of the IVC and the SVC. There's, I don't know, the fraction of blood might be, say, 50%. So that means that the other 50% of blood now is going to mix with it, it's going to, in the ventricle here, in the tricuspid valve in the ventricle here, it's going to immediately lower that PSO2. So when you're looking to see how someone's doing, you have to sample them from their arterial line, whether femoral line or whatever A line is, is on the patient, because otherwise you're going to have numbers that are just, you know, misplaced uh, uh, in that regard. So now, when we're looking at uh, weaning the patient, we'll just go slow. Um, in general, what we'd like to do is take someone off on conventional ARDS-NET protocol. And we would like to see that when we take someone off conventional ARDS-NET protocol, in the most ideal circumstances, that we're able to take them off when they have an FiO2 of 60%. So why do I say 60%? Because when you come off ECMO, you don't want to go back on ECMO. So it would be great is to have your weaning the patients off ECMO if you're only on 60% and you had a small setback as you're still treating for that patient, you have plenty of room to go up on a higher fraction of oxygen. We will accept 80% of FiO2, especially when you start to go to four and five days on ECMO, because the longer you're on ECMO, the more other complications can, uh, uh, can occur while you're at ECMO, such as blood transfusions, et cetera, which carry their own risks. Um, but in general, what we're, doing, what we're looking at doing is resting for day one, and then days two, three, and four, it could be a slow wean down to get someone off, and then we finally you know, come off ECMO. So what does this look like uh, here? Well, there's a few things that we're going to turn down on the ECMO machine as we come down. What we're going to do is we're going to come down on the FiO2. And we usually come down all the way to 30%. Or we can come down to room air. That's the first thing. The sec thing, second thing we're going to do is we're going to decrease our sweeps. And usually we come down to sweeps uh, maybe like two liters. We tend not to go lower than that. Um, the last thing we come down is how quickly the blood is being moved through the system. And we can come down on the rotor, come down to, uh, I'll call it the rotor, to no more than 1.5 liters. When you go below that, you run the risk of clotting the ECMO machine, and that's why we don't go below that. So this is what we're slowly weaning the ECMO machine down to as we're slowly giving the patient more and more responsibility. What does that mean? We're slowly increasing, uh, when the patient here is on these settings, we have them on room air, or maybe 30%, one or the other. So we're, we're increasing our fraction of oxygen on this patient up to 60%. We're slowly increasing their tidal volumes up to something on some ARDS net, which basically means 60 Cs per kilo. And then we're slowly coming down on these parameters here. When we finally get down to, say, the 60% here, and then this, you know, 6 cc's per kilo, and they're doing well, then the next step is, is that we literally clamp the circuit. And so we have two lines that are coming out of the ECMO machine. We have the arterial side and the venous side. So we clamp both of those. It's important to note that when you clamp them, blood is now static. Um, and uh, that ECMO machine uh, could clot then. So what you do is you put 5,000 units of heparin uh, into the machine as you're waiting. You see how the patient does in their clamp trial, and then if they're okay, then they come off. Um, uh, where do I see us going with our uh, BV ECMO program? Um, I'm very excited about having the BV ECMO program here. Um, I think uh, I want to emphasize that it's really going to be patient selection for patients that we think that we can you know, have a reversible cause uh, for them. Um, I think that's really that's all I want to emphasize, patient selection. And I think we have all the mechanics here to have great outcomes for these individuals. Um, and I look forward to treating patients with you in the very near future. That's it. That's ECMO and BV ECMO. We'll have another uh, uh, talk about uh, VA. I'll have that one be separate. That's a whole other animal when you're looking at how to have um, patients uh, come off of VA ECMO. I'll, last thing I'll come, I'll come out here is when you have a well-running program, survival rates are 70%. I mean, this is incredible because the patients you're putting on ECMO are like near guaranteed to die if nothing else happens. Um, and so having a 70% survival is incredible. That's the high number. Um, it's anywhere from 60 to 70 percent The Australians have about 70% survival. That's different with VA ECMO where under the best hands it has about 30% survival.
It's a much, much more difficult thing to manage as a VA. Question, um, what was it about um, really wanting to wean uh, the ECMO off in about three days? I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, Patty had a question. The question was, is, you know, what is it about trying to uh, wean people off of ECMO uh, in three days? Generally, we feel as if the longer you're on ECMO, the, the, the worse your chances are to come off. So there's a, there's a sweet spot. There is a, an opening. There's an opportunity. Uh, we call it like a window uh, for you to come off. And in general, we try to come off ECMO within three to five days. And if you're on ECMO after the fifth day, your chances of coming off are so low, we start to go into what we consider really futile care. And then we withdraw it too. So it's just, it's about this uh, window phenomenon that we feel as if you're, you're most optimized. It's important to realize that when you're on um, ECMO, you're probably getting a lot of blood products. And blood products are now known to decrease survival. Um, they uh, increase morbidity and mortality. Um, that was uh, first discovered with the TRIC trial, transfusion uh, in critically ill patients. Um, and that is why most of us use a transfusion trigger of seven. Um, uh, grams per deciliter for hemoglobin for transfusion because um, it's well known that in the population that's 55 years and younger, um, if you were to increase over seven with each transfusion, you actually increase their chances of mortality. So, yeah. so in that case, would you use other uh, crystal colloids in replacement of blood? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, this being said, that trial for transfusion-related and critical illness, that was not in ECMO patients. This is actually controversial. For ECMO patients, we actually um, tend to have a higher hemoglobin concentration up to 10. Um, that's, uh, that's very common to do. But the point is still uh, notwithstanding that it seems to be this delicate play between if you're giving the patient more blood products, there is chance of, uh, of increased mortality. So you're trying to give as little as possible. The best thing you can do is come off ECMO as soon as possible. And then can you speak to um, the involvement of CRRT, the importance of CRRT in patients like this? Sure. Um, absolutely. So a lot of our patients um, who are going to go on ECMO um, are going to have multi-organ system failure. Um, these are going to be your ARDS patients who are on three pressors who are uh, very uh, fragile. Um, so in General, to make it as simple as possible, you have two basic methods where if you have renal failure, to clean someone's blood, quote unquote, clean their blood. Um, in hemodialysis, broadly speaking, what you're using is you're using a pressure gradient, you're using pressure. That's why someone has to have a blood pressure in general. Um, you're, in essence, pushing some solutes across a membrane uh, with the pressure gradient. Now, if you have a blood pressure, you can do that. You can have your solutes move across and you can exchange, and you can actually do your whole dialysis treatment in a much shorter period of time, three hours. If you are critically ill on three pressors and you have no blood pressure, you're not going to have that perfusion difference. Um, and so you have to find another way to get the solutes across. And so by changing concentrations of solutes across the membrane, and by changing charge, what you can do is in essence pull the solutes across uh, the membrane in a more gentle fashion. What you're also doing is instead of doing the whole treatment in say three or four hours, you're also doing it over the course of 24. So it's both a more gentle way of solute mover as well as a more gentle way of doing it over a prolonged period of time. Um, and our patients are going to require CDVH as their treatment on this because they're going to need that much more gentle, uh, gentle approach. CDVH, uh, unlike HD, can also remove larger uh, solutes, larger molecules. And there, is, there are some people that believe that there could be mortality benefit in patients with sepsis because you might be removing cytokines um, from patients' bloodstream. I personally happen to be a believer of that because I've seen incredible saves and incredible outcomes on the patients I've treated with CVDH. The data is still out there, so I don't want you to go home and think about that and say that's, that's gospel. But um, that is one school of thought, and I actually prescribe to that school of thought uh, as well. Yeah. Quick, be oh, sure, minutes. sure. Um, so the question is, is um, uh, is it important to start, well, uh, actually, Look early, then wait to wait. Right. So the most important thing with ECMO is to start ECMO early instead of late. So this is basically, what are we doing in ECMO? We're, we're resting. And we're allowing the body to heal and to get stronger. If you have waited two or three or four days and you've allowed that patient to become just horribly deconditioned, and now you're going to rest them after they haven't eaten for five days, 
they've been bed bound, they've been atrophied, et cetera, et cetera. Now you're going to expect them to rehab. It's a very poor choice. If you would have gotten them four or five days earlier when they were still, you know, having much more of their vital capacity within them, then you know, then the struggle. So that's why we try to institute early, the rest of them early, so they maintain their strength so that they can heal on their own. That's a very, very, very if you if you think about it, in general we say that if someone is in respiratory failure, um, it's kind of contraindicated maybe to think about putting these patients on ECMO after five days or so. You know, you've waited too long. Some people will even say three days, but you get that idea. There's a window there that if you go too past, it's not a good idea to put on ECMO, so they're probably not going to come off. Yeah? All right.